Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll begin very shortly. All right. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Meta Pollywall with the Orange County Water District. On behalf of everyone here at OCWD, I'm excited to welcome you for our June webinar, PFAS, Encouraging Results from the OCWD Treatment Study, where you will hear an update on the district's completed project and next steps. Before we begin, I'd like to go over just a few housekeeping items. As a webinar attendee, you are muted. Uh, this is just to reduce some background noise. However, should you have a question for our speakers, uh, please feel free to type them into the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. And to keep the webinar moving along, we will wait until the end of the presentations to answer questions. But feel free to ask those questions along the way and as you think of them, and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. Um, one last item, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to our YouTube channel at OCWD Water News. And without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speakers for today. Dr. Megan Plumley. Megan Plumley is the Director of Research and Development for the Orange County Water District, where she oversees a team of scientists and engineers who conduct applied research that supports the district's core operational needs. This includes evaluations of promising new technologies for recycled water treatment and groundwater recharge. Her current work includes oversight of OCWD's PFAS treatment study, which is testing various treatment options for removing PFAS from groundwater. And Dr. Scott Grieco. Dr. Grieco is the global technology leader for groundwater treatment with Jacobs Drinking Water and Reuse Group. His area of expertise is physical chemical treatment of emerging contaminants and persistent environmental compounds. For the past 10 years, Scott has focused on evaluation and treatment of PFAS in groundwater, surface water, wastewater, and landfill leachate. He has 30 years of experience in the evaluation, design, and optimization of water treatment systems across the public utility, remediation, and industrial sectors. So with that, let's go ahead and get started, and I will turn it over to Dr. Megan Plumley. and let's take it away. Thank you, Meta. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon, wherever you are. Thanks so much for joining us. Hopefully, you can all hear me all right and see um, the video. So about a year ago, Scott and I presented this project at about, about the halfway point of the project. So today, we're excited to share um, the conclusions from our treatment study. So this treatment study is really just one part of the overall, you know, PFAS work ongoing at Orange County Water District. Um, next slide. So as far as the, our plans for today and the outline, we'll do a quick introduction to PFAS in the district and explain our treatment study objectives, um, show you the results from the pilot, pilot scale and bench scale work that, that evaluated these different adsorbents for removing PFAS from groundwater, um, talk a bit about scale up of this data, to the full scale where the system is a lead bed followed by a lag bed uh, as far as the treatment vessels. And then briefly talk about cost evaluation and kind of summary and then where we're going next. Um, next slide. But first I'll quickly acknowledge all the different people who worked on this big project, um, including our research team um, that uh, worked on the piloting and other aspects of the project with Jacobs and our water quality and laboratory departments at Orange County Water District handling all the PFAS sampling and analysis in-house. Um, I'm co-presenting with Scott today from Jacobs and of course other folks at Jacobs worked on this as well, including um, Mike, Joseph and Jim. And then also uh, Jacobs worked with Battelle for the laboratory, some of the laboratory work. And so I'd like to acknowledge their um, big contribution as well. Next slide. And then our technology partners, we worked with a lot of different media providers who shared their expertise um, for the pilot and bench scale work. Um, so I'd like to thank them all for working so collaboratively with us on this project. Next slide. 
So quick introduction to PFAS and Orange County Water District and how this has impacted us. So what are PFAS? This is a big family of lots of different chemicals. What they have in common is that they have per and polyfluorinated alkyl chains. So we refer to them as per and polyfluoroalkyl substances or PFAS. And you'll hear us talk in particular about a couple of compounds called PFOA and PFOS, which are some of the compounds that are more frequently detected at impacted sites and also in a number of states, including California, have um, guidance or regulatory limits on the concentrations that are considered acceptable and for uh, limits for drinking water specifically. Um, and then we've had a, a quite a bit of media coverage in, um, in Orange County uh, related to the PFAS um, occurrence in the groundwater system here. So here's some of the, the media headlines there. Um, they get referred to as forever chemicals just related to the fact that they're so hard to destroy. So the adsorption technologies we'll be talking about today um, pull the compounds out of the water via an adsorption process as opposed to a destruction process. Next slide. So as far as who we are and, and as a water agency, we were formed in 1933 to manage the Orange County groundwater basin, which is the aquifer that underlies um, the area shown on the map, which is north and central Orange County. So this is our service area. And an additional role we have is to protect rights to the Santa, our rights to the Santa Ana River, which is a water supply for drinking water through groundwater augmentation. So we're a groundwater wholesaler and we provide this groundwater to 19 different municipal and special water districts. So these are the water retailers. Um, in our presentation today, you might hear us refer to them as groundwater producers. So these um, water retailers have these large drinking water production wells or groundwater wells um, that they pump to provide drinking water. So ultimately this groundwater supply is really important. It provides drinking water to about two and a half million residents in, in North and Central Orange County, which is about 77% of the local water supply. Next slide. So while we do have PFAS um, present at some locations in the groundwater system, I just wanna clarify really quickly that PFAS is not present in the advanced purified, treated, recycled water from our groundwater replenishment system or GWRS, because many folks that may be familiar with Orange County Water District have heard about our large um, purification plant for recycled water. Um, this facility generates purified water that we use for groundwater augmentation. So this is called indirect potable reuse. And you can see the facility circled there and then the water goes in a pipeline up to recharge basins in Anaheim where it's recharged into the groundwater supply. But removal of PFAS is um, well established by reverse osmosis or RO, which we use in the treatment process. And that's, and in fact, what we observe from our monitoring data as well. So it's highly effective for removal of PFAS, thus it's not found in the finished water from this process. Next slide. So then what is the potential source of PFAS in our groundwater system? So a number of investigations are ongoing, so we can try to understand this. Um, there's a number of different potential local sources. These include um, things like military bases, airports, chrome platers, landfills, any specific industrial sites that may have used or released PFAS. Fire training areas can be associated with PFAS release. But in the last bullet there, it's important to just recognize that PFAS is sort of ubiquitous in a lot of consumer products that we all use. Um, ranging from, you know, cosmetics, textiles, carpets, um, food packaging. Um, and so when we use these products in our homes and in businesses, um, when there's a possibility, then it can leach from um, into the, the wastewater. So the water that goes down the drain um, and then ends up in the sewer system, the collection system. So that PFAS laden um, wastewater travels to your local wastewater treatment plant. And these facilities were never designed to remove PFAS. So unfortunately, there's still PFAS in the treated water that comes from a wastewater treatment plant. And then that's discharged into the environment. In our case, locally, there's several wastewater treatment plants that discharge to the Santa Ana River. Um, and that um, flows down into our region. And then it can influence groundwater quality since the river water percolates into the ground through aquifer recharge. And so, Wastewater treatment plants referred to as publicly, publicly owned treatment works statewide are, care, are currently carrying out investigations in response to, to orders from the state to really understand the PFAS occurrence in the wastewater effluent. So this is a really important potential source as well. Uh, next slide. 
So as far as the extent of PFAS in our service area and the groundwater, it's pretty significant. 11 of the 19 different water retailers we serve have um, PFOA concentrations in, their, in some of their wells that are above this 10 nanogram per liter response level. That's an important reference number shown in the box to the left. Um, there's notification levels and response levels for a few different PFAS in California, um, which relate to, um, are specifically about drinking water. And so um, at these, uh, with these uh, response levels, it means that up to about a third of our groundwater basin water is unable to be served. It's, it's PFOA in particular that we have sites that are above the um, response level. It's less so for the PFOS compound in our case. And so this trend, uh, this is a big impact. And in the meantime, water retailers can turn to alternative supplies um, but these supplies like imported water are much more expensive. So it's a significant um, additional cost to rely on um, a non-groundwater uh, supply. Next slide. So our goal is to restore the groundwater supply as quickly as we can to restore our local um, really important drinking water source. So design and also and now construction at some sites is, is underway for um, PFAS treatment systems at these wells. And so this work is ongoing for the 11 different water retailers I mentioned. Our role as the groundwater wholesaler, we made the decision to fund all these capital costs for these systems, as well as share in the O&M costs with the water retailers. And our goal, we already have one system that was constructed and is operating. So one is online and our goal is to bring the remaining systems online within two years. And I like this, um, site layout map because it gives you a sense for the different size of ion exchange versus granular activated carbon, which are two of the key technologies we evaluated in the treatment study. So this map shows a well, um, it's the blue box off to the right, nestled in a neighborhood here. And the yellow circles represent the big tanks that would hold ion exchange media and the, the, and the GAC, so that's the footprint of the, the ion exchange system is the four vessels there. And then a GAC system would be the yellow plus the white. So it's, it, GAC does take more space compared to ion exchange. Next slide. So as far as the goals of our treatment study, next slide, the key was to really try to understand what, what adsorbent should be used in these treatment vessels to best remove PFAS at these sites and for the best value. So there's three main groups of adsorbents that we looked at, granular activated carbon, ion exchange, and alternative adsorbents that don't, you know, aren't classified into either of those two categories. We also have referred to them as novel adsorbents in our project. And the photograph there shows you what these large um, treatment vessels look like that would be filled with the media. So our study began in December of 2019 um, to test these various adsorbents at both laboratory scale and pilot scale. So we worked with Jacobs to complete this treatment study. Um, and they in turn also worked with Patel to carry out the, some of the laboratory aspects of the adsorbent evaluations. Next slide. Here's a photograph to give you an idea of what these um, media look like. Um, the, the, the GAC and the alternative adsorbents look like a crushed rock with different colors. Um, GAC is always black, but the alternative adsorbents just kind of depends on you know, what it is. So we've got some interesting colors. And then ion exchange um, is little resin beads of this one's white, but they kind of have a, sometimes a yellowish or an orangish color. Next slide. And the concept is pretty simple. The media goes into a treatment vessel and the influent water, in this case, groundwater from our sites would come in and carries the PFAS, but then the PFAS absorbs to the media in the treatment vessel. And so it's removed so that your treated water or your effluent um, has no PFAS um, in a, so this is true, you know, in a bench scale test column or a, a pilot scale column or a, or a full scale treatment vessel. Eventually the media becomes spent, becomes consumed and PFAS starts to break through. So you start seeing PFAS in the effluent. In a full scale system, two beds are placed in series, a lead vessel and a lag vessel. So you can tolerate some amount of PFAS breakthrough into the effluent for the lead vessel because then that water becomes the influent into the lag vessel and then the rest of the, the remaining PFAS is removed. Next slide. So now I'll go over our pilot testing. Um, next slide. We located the pilot adjacent to one of our Santa Ana River water recharge basins called Warner Basin, where we had a district owned non-potable 
well to supply the groundwater to the pilot. This site is in Anaheim. And the PFAS occurrence and concentrations in that well water that supplied the pilot are shown there in the table. Pretty low concentrations of not very many PFAS as measured by method um, EPA standard method 537.1. Um, which is pretty typical of the local groundwater at the different drinking water production wells as well. Next slide. So as far as the testing program for the pilot, um, we evaluated quite a large number of products. When Jacobs was completing the market survey, um, we kept encountering products that had been looked at in other uh, testing or else not evaluated any, any test yet. Um, in a drinking water application and finding more and more. So we upsized the overall project to test in total 14 different adsorbents in our pilot. So eight different GACs, four different ion exchange resins and a couple different alternative adsorbents. For the granule activated carbon, the empty bed contact time uh, was 10 minutes, which is more typical for a PFAS treatment system. It requires the longer contact times between the media and the water to get the same degree of PFAS removal. So that larger EBCT is what drives that larger footprint needed for the, the, the treatment system compared to ion exchange at two minutes. And then with the alternative adsorbents, it just depends on uh, the adsorbent. So we worked with those um, uh, manufacturers to, to decide on an EBCT that would be appropriate for this, this test. Um, we looked at all of these media at pilot scale, but for the laboratory um, component of the work, which Scott will talk about later, we only looked at the crushable media, so the GAC and alternative adsorbents, not the ion exchange, just based on the standard method um, available at the time for the, the laboratory scale um, adsorbent assessment testing. Um, I often get asked to what extent the media we looked at in our project can be regenerated for reuse, meaning that once it's spent, it can be hauled away and the PFAS and organics removed and brought back to you so that you can reuse the material. And it really just depends on the different adsorbents. So GACs, Yes, they can be reactivated and you can reuse the media again for ion exchange. We just looked at single use resins. So these would be thrown away after they're spent. Um, for the alternative adsorbents, it just depends on the technology and whether that's a service that the company can offer. Next slide. So we set up this prefabricated building adjacent to Warner Basin, which you can see in the background of the one of the photographs there um, to house the pilot. Next slide. And this is what the pilot skids look like inside the building. On the left are the GAC skids. You can see the black color showing through those transparent columns. And on the right is the ion exchange skid, which is a bit smaller. And we were able to test the two alternative adsorbents on this skid as well. So there's the four ion exchange products and the two alternative adsorbents. They all started out with lighter, brighter colors and then the ion exchange and alternative adsorbents darken a little bit or, or quite a bit depending on the media as the water continues to, continues to filter through. Next slide. Before I share some of the pilot data, just a quick disclaimer that results for one water agency's test like ours can be very different um, at another site. So just take the data with a grain of salt if you're thinking about um, doing testing with your facility or for your client. Um, this is a good example of that where the data on the left is from our pilot for ion exchange resins and the data on the right is from a different state's um, pilot test of the same of two of the same two of the the same two of the four that we tested and you see some opposite results because for example in our case on the left with PFOA on the y-axis that is the concentration in the treated effluent coming from the pilot system and on the x-axis this is time months of duration of piloting you can see that the ion exchange product colored in, in pink there uh, showed the better performance, meaning it had a later breakthrough of PFOA at a lower um, sustained PFOA concentration versus it broke through first in the other um, pilot at the other site. So it just illustrates the importance of doing some site-specific testing to really understand different products' performance relative to one another for your particular background water quality, like your dissolved organic carbon concentration or, or perhaps inorganics in the water that can influence the PFAS uptake uh, and breakthrough timing for different media. So with that disclaimer, next slide, I'll share some of the pilot results. It's a lot of data. Um, I'll try to highlight some of the key takeaways, but this is how the breakthrough curves look. They look very similar for the lab scale testing as well. So the y-axis again is the PFAS concentration in the treated water. So in this uh, 
portion of the chart, I'm just showing the PFOA breakthrough curves. And the x-axis is the months that we piloted. We're still running this pilot now. And also time can be plotted here as number of bed volumes of water treated by the system, which will vary based on its empty bed contact time. Um, the horizontal black dashed line is the influent concentration. So in principle, if you run a pilot for long enough, the or a lab scale column for long enough, you'll eventually have your effluent concentrations match your influent concentrations, meaning that you have 100% breakthrough. So you can see we've gotten there for certain media that we tested. Um, the red line is just for reference as uh, the uh, response level, 10 nanograms per liter for PFOA. So some products have reached that point, others have not yet. Um, next slide. So some, some ways to look at this data is to understand that what you would expect to see is that initially the effluent PFAS is non-detectable, shown with the green arrow there in my example, which is from ion exchange. And then you start to see breakthrough and that time to initial breakthrough um, is shown with the blue arrow there. That's when it first pops up above the detection limit. Um, and there's a tendency to focus on that because that's what you see first and kind of compare the products to one another. You want to see later initial breakthrough. But actually through our study and the lead lag modeling that Jacobs performed, we realized that we learned that, you know, the time it takes to more significant breakthrough is probably more relevant in terms of comparing media to one another. Um, and that's because this later time to breakthrough, such as about maybe 60% breakthrough, um, corresponds more to the timing of um, when you would actually change out the media in the full scale system to refresh it with new media. So this is kind of the lens that we looked at the data with to think about comparing performance of media to one another is not just time to initial breakthrough, but actually time to more significant breakthrough, which happens to correspond to the red line, the 10 um, nanogram per liter for our water corresponds to about 60% breakthrough. Uh, next slide. So starting just with the, so I've added now a row for the PFOS data. So same concept, but now just PFOS breakthrough curves. And one takeaway for the GACs, which are the first two columns is the bituminous GACs. Each color represents a different GAC that we tested. And then the second column is the non-bituminous and blended GACs. Um, for these uh, GACs that we evaluated, we did see that the bituminous GACs like the Calgon F400, which is plotted in orange, um, performed better than the non-bituminous or blended products, meaning a later breakthrough looking at PFOA and PFOS. And overall, uh, Calgon F400 was, um, showed the best performance. Again, that's the orange line, but we also tested a reactivated uh, version of Calgon F400 for comparison, and that's the red line. So very similar results, which was consistent with the laboratory scale testing as well. Next slide. For ion exchange, that's the center column there. Um, it was interesting how the four that we tested, three of them kind of grouped together. The lines are on top of each other a bit there, the turquoise and, and green and gray, with the later breakthrough of the pink line, which is the Evoqua PSR2 plus resin. So this one showed superior performance for PFOA. And PFOA is really the driver in our project. It'll drive the media change out times for the full scale systems. Um, all four of the ion exchange products showed later breakthrough of PFOS compared to all eight GACs. So you can see that for PFOS, we don't have any ion exchange breakthrough yet, um, nor for the alternative adsorbents either. Um, and then all four of the ion exchange also showed later breakthrough of short chain PFAS, which you'll see with the next click, go ahead and advance. Um, the last row there is the uh, short chain, the only short chain compound present in our um, groundwater that supplies water to this pilot. It's perfluorobutane sulfonate or PFBS. So ion exchange also showed later breakthrough of this short chain compound compared to the GACs, which was um, expected based on what we knew from other studies. Um, another important takeaway was really the pretty um, uh, good performance of the SETCO fluorosorb 200 product, which is the alternative adsorbent plotted in the purple color there with the two minute mg -band contact time. So it has the same contact time as ion exchange. So it would have the same full scale footprint. But you can see for PFOA, the later breakthrough similar to the, the pink line, the pink um, ion exchange product. So good performance there. Also no breakthrough yet for PFOS. Um, it does have breakthrough for the short, the short chain PFBS, however, um, whereas the PSR2 plus um, Evoqua um, ion exchange resin does not. So just different comparisons based on, you know, um, 
depending on which PFAS you look at. Um, for the other alternative adsorbent we tested in the last column there, plotted in orange, that is the Cyclopyridexorb Plus product. And it actually showed earlier breakthrough of PFOA relative to other media. And that was a bit of a surprise based on its good performance and some other tests. So it really just, you know, again, highlights the importance to do importance of doing the site specific testing because you can get different uh, breakthrough than maybe you expect um, compared to other, other sites. Next slide. So how is this pilot data being used? It's supporting our initial ion exchange media procurements for the full scale systems and the system permits that we're obtaining. Um, ion exchange was selected for the majority of the treatment sites across um, the impacted water retailers, largely driven by footprint, since a lot of these sites don't have enough space for to accommodate the larger GAC system. So before even necessarily um, having the pilot information yet, um, it was it already became clear for certain sites that they were going to need to go with ion exchange. Um, so for these sites, based on the bids received for the ion exchange media, and then looking at the pilot performance of the different media um, to understand best value um, of product, Evoqua PSR2 Plus was selected predominantly um, for these first three systems that are coming online in our project. And this rendering gives you a visual of what um, one site looks like for the city of Fullerton that will be an ion exchange system. There, It's two systems with the lead lag vessels, that's four vessels. Next slide. And now I will turn it over to Scott to go over the laboratory scale work. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, we can go forward to the next slide. So the laboratory work uh, focused on the, the rapid small scale column testing RSSCTs, like Megan mentioned. Um, so we performed these um, for the GAC and the alternative adsorbents. This was a large scope where we, uh, we looked at, we had eight columns in parallel that we could test. So um, we, we generally ran all eight columns for each producer water and um, we were able to test uh, up to 10 waters um, over the course of the program. So we had nine different uh, producer waters plus the Orange County water from the, the, the Warner Basin that, that Megan identified. Um, and then we also looked at how these RSSCT data uh, can predict full scale performance. So um, I, I have a couple slides on that to show a relationship between the RSSCT data and the pilot data that, that Megan just just presented. And I will say that all the RSSCTs were performed under what's known as constant diffusivity um, assumptions. So that's just a, the particular design of the RSSCT. And if you're focused on RSSCTs, it may be important to know that as, as we're looking at the, the scale up parameters. Next slide. So this gives you an idea of um, the different producer locations and the, the wells that were uh, used for, for each of the, the water sources for the RSSCT testing, just to give a, a general idea of, of distribution across the, 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 the Orange County Basin in, in relationship to uh, each other and um, to, to other aspects of location in terms of uh, surface water and uh, recharge basins, things like that. Next slide. I don't see anything moving. I'm not sure if anyone else does. Ah, there it goes. So um, to jump in to a large picture snapshot of all the GAC, um, you can see the different uh, the, the 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 nine different producers down on the bottom, plus the the Orange County uh, Bessie Well, and all these data are presented um, as the amount of bed volumes required to treat to that sixty percent uh, PFOA concentration that that was indicated earlier by Megan. Um, you can see that for the, the first four or five rounds of testing, um, we did test uh, a, a good majority of the products. Um, but as we started to, to move further through the program, um, actually what ended up happening quite coincidentally, one, one maybe um, silver lining out of the, out of, out of the COVID 
uh, issue in terms of having to manage this program through COVID was that uh, we had a bit of a stop with the laboratory um, and in, it gave us a chance to review all the data and, and look at the patterns that were happening after the, the first four tests. So um, it allowed us to uh, make some assessments and um, add in some additional carbons that weren't able to be evaluated um, during the first few rounds just because of the spots that we had available. Um, so you can see here, as, as Megan mentioned on the pilot, that the, uh, the orange uh, F400 and the Avoqua UltraCarb, the purple, um, tended to perform better, um, certainly against a larger group of data that, that we had in the first four, and then you know, continued to outperform uh, the other products as we, as we looked at uh, a, a more limited set of GAC, and that allowed us to work in more uh, rounds of the alternative adsorbents that I'll, I'll be presenting in a little bit as well. Next slide. So as with the pilot, um, on the um, on the RSSETs, we also evaluated the virgin reactivated carbons. Um, interesting here is that I've, I'm presenting data from, from four different producers in, in the Orange County well, or three different producers in the Orange County well. Um, virgin is is orange and the reactivated is in in red and again the uh the criteria on the x on the y-axis is to reach 60 percent of the influent pfoa concentration uh these are arranged in highest background doc to, to lowest background doc from from left to, to right and you can see that uh generally there's an equivalent performance at the higher doc um, where we saw a, a bit of a gap um, as we move to the lower DOCs where the virgin somewhat outperformed um, the, the, the reactivated product on the bench scale. Um, we didn't see as much of a difference on the pilot scale as you saw from the previous slides. And also maybe just to point it out as a, as a reference point, uh, McNamara has, has done some work and uh, published some information that showed that there is better performance of reactivated and, and they used a background uh, total organic carbon of 1.42. Um, so just to kind of frame it in, we didn't see a significant difference, you know, at the higher, higher DOCs. At the lower DOCs, it was within 25%. Um, but again, these, you know, the, these are definitely uh, not uh, duplicative data sets within, you know, uh, multiple columns. So um, it may be even within the columns themselves, the, 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 the data sets that show a little bit of difference are, are probably within some margin of error of the RSS CTs. So overall, pretty good agreement with, with the pilot, uh, you know, with the virgin versus reactivated. Next slide. So maybe this is a good point to step, take a little step back um, with the lead lag configuration to, in case um, you're wondering where that 60% specifically comes from. So um, in a lead lag arrangement, we, you know, we have the cartoon shown there of the vessels. And what these data show is that um, the, the, the green data in, in, the, in, in the squares are either the pilot data or RSSCT data that are obtained from experimental um, testing. And, and then we um, use a model to, to fit those data and then project the um, lag bed, which is in the blue, um, as a, as fr from the, the lead bed performance, um, given, given those model characteristics. And so where the 60% comes from is if you see where, where, where you know, the, the ultimate goal in a lead lag would be to, to have a non-detect or, or very, you know, target very low concentrations of the effluent. Um, in this particular example, and very similar to a lot of other data that we've modeled uh, through this program, um, at a, at a non-detect level less than a half a nanogram per liter, um, we're at about 11 uh, nanograms per liter in, in the combined effluent of the, the, the lead, bag, lead lag bed, so out of the lag bed. Um, so we're still non-detect there, 11 nanograms per liter on the uh, lead bed is about 60%. And then if you, you know, just to show a range there, if you target two nanograms per liter, which is generally the, you know, the, the analytical detection reporting limit, um, you could be even higher than 60%. So we generally 
generally use 60% as the criteria for a single column evaluation, knowing that they would go into a lead lag configuration. And so that's kind of the basis of that 60%. Next slide. So here is a overall snapshot of the F400 um, for the RSSCPs with for, for the PFOA um, across all the different waters tested. And you can see here that um, the P, you know, one, one thing to mention is, as Megan mentioned earlier, the, the PFOA concentrations across the different producer waters were generally consistent. Um, so we, we've presented these not as actual concentrations, but as relative concentrations to the influent or C over C naught. Um, so that's just a scale of, uh, of zero to one or zero to 100% um, influent. And um, there's a range of, of performance with the Orange County Water District, Bessie Well, the, the, the yellow data, um, that is actually the highest DOC water tested at 1.6. Um, and there's a gradation of performance with continued um, life of, of the bed and in, in projected um projected full scale uh, you know, length of time that it would operate you know, it, with, with respect to the RSSCP bed volumes, which is a direct relationship to a full scale bed volume. So you can see here that we've, we were uh, to meet 60%, uh, we were at 50,000 bed volumes or so for the, um, for, for the shortest run and in well over 300,000 bed volumes for, for the longest run. Um, so that equates to a, a bit less than a year in terms of full-scale operation to, to more than four or five years of full-scale operation. And um, given the, the background water quality, we, we see that there's a large dependency of DOC um, with respect to the P PFOA removal um, with, with the, the, the lowest concentrations of DOC around 0 0.2 milligrams per liter, having the, the, the longest run times at, at well over 300,000 bed volumes. Next slide. So one of the interesting things about this study is we, we were able to kind of window in not only in terms of the quantity of dissolved organic carbon, but, but do a, a more detailed study on the, the, the makeup of the organic carbon. Um, so working with the Orange County's lab, uh, we ran excitation emis emission matrix or EAMS fluorescence spectroscopy. And I'm only going to say that once because I got it out the first time. So uh, beyond this, I'll just refer to it as EAMS. Uh, there's five excitation emission regions, if you're not familiar with, with this uh, data output in, in the the, uh, the legend is shown on that top figure there. Um, so there's regions for aromatic proteins, uh, fulvic acids, and humic acids, and hydrophilic acids. Um, we expect that the, there would be some level of adsorption of aromatic proteins and fulvic and humic acids to the carbon where there might be more limited adsorption or no adsorption with hydrophilic acids, which are small and soluble and typically are not adsorbable. Um, the other thing is, is that it, it, on top of the graphical output that you see here, which are considered heat maps, um, the, the numerical data are also provided in fluorescence units or AFUs. So across the bottom, um, I just provided three uh, representative different waters that uh, have somewhat different DOC values, Orange County, Bessie Well being the 1.6 that I mentioned, and Fullerton and IR, IRWD being uh, closer to one or, or a little bit below one. Um, so not a huge difference in terms of the magnitude of the DOC, but you can see here visually uh, a significant difference in terms of the makeup of what, what comprises that DOC. So for example, with the Orange County, Bessie Well, you see a, a reason reasonably high fluorescence um, in excitation of um, humic acids, uh, which, which are in that green and, and, and yellow blob, um, and then um, a significant portion of fulvic acids down at the bottom, which are, are actually much higher intensity in the, in the, the red and, and very dark red. Um, Fullerton, for example, has a somewhat of a similar 
pattern characteristic in terms of the emission, um, but the heat map is obviously much less, so much, much less quantities of, of those same compounds than what we saw in Orange County Water District. And yet um, IRWD provides uh, a third differential of, of the types of water that we may see where there's not as much humic and fulvic acid and, and there's a much higher intensity of the, the aromatic proteins or what are considered essential um, in, in maybe into the range of soluble microbial byproducts um, that, that, that may or may not be uh, significantly absorbable. Uh, next slide. So what we did is we used these data to, with a multivariable regression, and we, we evaluated the influence of DOC, humic acids, the fulvic acids, and the aromatic proteins. Um, and using that multivariable regression, uh, we were able to, to identify that the DOC and the humic acids were actually the, 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 the two components that were statistically significant to rep represent the data. So as a, as a function of the, the different producers, you can see the, the, the bed volumes measured um, in, in the, the individual data sets, and then what would be predicted through the model, uh, the multivariable regression model for all four components as well as the, the humic and the DOC only. Um, there's uh, virtually no difference using only the statistically significant data, uh, the DOC and the humic, which we would expect since those are the most significant variables. And the, uh, the output of, of that relationship is given there at the bottom. Um, so this gives a, a good indication um, using DOC and humic acids only for other producers or other wells within this area, with, within the basin to be able to be project, you know, predictive of um, how long a, a carbon system will last given, given a very limited number of data that, that is readily you know, obtained you know, with DOC and, and the humic acids through the EAMS. Next slide. So that was a pretty interesting um, application for, for the study. Uh, the other thing that's also of interest is not only the, 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 the reasonably natural or, or maybe a microbial byproduct um, DOC, but, but we also looked at anthropogenic VOCs. Uh, there, there was one particular producer, Fullerton, that, that wanted to, to look at VOCs uh, on, on top of PFAS and understand how the VOCs may impact uh, PFOA removal with the with the carbon. Um, on the the graph on the left shows the darker da data are are the non spiked uh, non DCE PCE and TCE containing uh, water without VOCs. Um, you can see the the lighter set of data um, for the Calgon and Avoqua represent the performance of the PFOA effluent out of the RSSCT with VOC spike. Um, there's a significant uh, competition in reduction in, in PFOA capacity and in quicker breakthrough um, when the VOCs are added. And on the, the right, um, combining that information I just showed you, the, the dashed line represents that multivariable regression model, um, the relationship between DOC and bed volumes treated using a humic acid value AFU of five, which is uh, pretty similar to um, a lot of the, the data that, that, that we had um, obtained and very similar to, to what Fullerton actually had uh, as an AFU number. You can see the Fullerton data, the hollow data without VOCs, it, it falls right on that model projection very well. But when VOCs are added, um, what, what we would have projected without VOCs at about 160,000 bed volumes of, of performance before 60% before exhaustion gets reduced to almost 50,000. So we do see a significant impact um, with these data with, with, a, with minor amounts of VOCs present um, as, as a competitive uh, absorption function for PFOA. Next slide. So just touching real quick on the fluorosorb um, and dexorb, um, the, the alternative adsorbents. Um, fluorosorb is shown on the 
uh, on the left and Dexorb is shown on the right. Uh, we, we had an opportunity to run uh, eight different water producers with Florzorb and, and five different with Dexorb. Uh, the data are shown as volume filtered and uh, just to give them an individual perspective of how they, they, they worked uh, comparatively to each other um, in terms of the total volume filtered on the RSSCT as well as within each other. Uh, Florzorb you can see had a, um, other than the Santa Ana data, which is a little bit um, anomalous in terms of its, its background water quality. Um, the rest of the data were reasonably well grouped, um, about a 50% difference between the lowest DOC waters and the highest DOC waters, um, certainly not the range we saw with, with, with carbon. So it is a little less um, or a lot less uh, influenced by, by competitive background DOC. Um, the the, the Dexorb was, was similarly grouped about a factor of two difference between the highest and the lowest, um, maybe a little bit more, about two and a half. Um, but you can also see that they were grouped very um, consistently in terms of lower volume able to be filtered to meet that same criteria. Next slide. So you might wonder how this compares to the carbon. Um, and we weren't able to necessarily directly compare it to ion exchange since we, we don't have um, you know, RSSCTs for ion exchange and we're waiting for the rest of the breakthrough data to, to occur um, on the pilot to do a direct comparison. But you can see the direct comparison. Um, I've included the, the highest and the lowest DOC values um, as I mentioned, the fluorosorb is fairly innocuous to, to DOC, so you can see the performance in the light blue there is about the same, uh, regardless of the background DOC. As we'd expect with the, you know, with the carbon, there's there's a significant uh, difference where they're they're very tightly grouped and, and break through quickly at a high DOC. They spread out more. Um, the purple and the orange with the lower DOC and the Dexorb was was fairly consistently performing between the two and and broke through quickest between all four of the media. Next slide. So um, in in. I don't want to spend a lot of time on the numbers here, but just wanted to provide, um, because we're looking at different empty bed contact times, because we're looking at different material densities, there's a couple different ways that you can evaluate comparative products like that. Uh, one is cumulative mass loading or equilibrium loading, how, much, how many nanograms of PFOA um, or PFAS you can lo load per milligram of adsorbent. Um, the other way to look at it is specific volume loading, how many liters can you process through per, per gram of adsorbent? And that really helps you know, normalize things with different density and different empty bed contact times. Um, you can see, especially looking at the specific volume loading, um, that for the at the higher DOC levels, um, there was a higher specific volume loading for Dexorb and significantly higher uh, sub specific volume loading for the Fluorzorb compared to the Calgon or Avoqua carbons. Um, it, for Garden Grove, those numbers all increased to some degree um, for, for each particular product. Um, but you can see that as, as the DOC goes down, um, Again, the Dexorb doesn't change much in terms of its specific loading. The, the carbon goes up significantly because we recognize the lack of uh, competitive adsorption influences there. And the fluorosorb goes up uh, a slight, slight amount. So it gives you a good comparison um, with kind of normalizing all the data so everything's on an equal footing. Next slide. So real quickly on scale-up considerations, next slide. Um, we use the Benson's pilot scale data, like I said, to uh, take a look at scale-up. Florizorb um, is still in operation in the pilot, so I'm, I'm gonna mainly focus on, on the carbons here uh, for, for scale-up purposes. Next slide. So looking at all the different carbons, um, this. These data are from 150 days of operation or about 21,000 bed volumes, so fairly early in the, the performance um, are, are the RSSCT versus the pilot in green, and it provides just the normalized you know, C over C not concentrations measured at, at, at that point, the 21,000 bed volumes um, at, at, 
at both scales. Um, you, can, you, you can observe in this data that the RSSCT does exhibit faster breakthrough, um, which provides a conservative assess, assessment and, and maybe not, you know, uh, obviously directly comparative when we're looking at, you know, uh, very early operations. Um, so it, the, the RSSCTs generally broke through quicker and had higher concentrations at that point compared to the, the corresponding pilot for each material. But if you go to the next slide, it really changes when we get to um, exhaustion parameters that are closer to actual operation. So then we reevaluated the system at 390 days of operation or about 56,000 bed volumes. Our SSCTs turned out to be very predictive at that point uh, of and, and very um, commensurate with the, with the pilot data. Um, a lot of them were within the margin of error of, of the testing, as you can see by the R error bars there, um, really um, going to pretty much uh, equivalent concentrations, um, both for the pilot and the RSSCT, so one-to-one -one correlation. There were a few products, as I have listed there, the F600 and the GAC400, for example, that uh, the C over C0 was still greater for the RSSCT, but when you look at the error bars, I still believe it's within the estimated margin of error for testing. So overall, when we're looking at exhaustion and change out of a lead bed, we feel that the RSSCT data uh, are, are pretty predictive for full-scale operations, both at the pilot and the full-scale, based on these data. Next slide. Just want to talk a little bit about cost evaluations before I hand it back over to Megan for, for conclusions. Um, we did perform uh, generalized cost evaluations, class four uh, level estimates. Um, we, we calculated it both in terms of actual dollars and total water unit co costs in terms of dollars per acre foot. And that included both capital and O&M, O&M including energy costs, material uh, costs, uh, you know, obviously media replacement and disposal costs. Um, we developed these not specifically for media by media and producer by producer, but, but general cost estimates for media groups. So we compared GAC, ion exchange, and alternative adsorbents, the, the best performing uh, media out of each of those, as well as compared them against nanofiltration membrane treatment. We, did do, uh, we didn't really have time to talk about it here during this, uh, th this webinar, but we did have a separate nanofiltration bench scale test going on to evaluate nanofiltration um, and, and look at PFAS removal through, through that uh, lower pressure membrane. Next slide. So for the eight GACs evaluated, um, what we did was we took the total unit cost for the two best value GACs, the Calgon and the Avoca, as we, as we looked at in the technical data. What I will say is that they were similar across the sites within 10% uh, of each other. Um, so that does suggest that, you know, given the, the margin of error that you'd likely see with RSSCTs and just, you know, budget costing that they're, they're generally equivalent. Um, they, they were very close to each other. We did um, obviously see that the longer media life for the lower DOC water uh, improved the economics and, and also use of the reactivated GAC is more cost effective over the virgin GAC, even though there wasn't much of a performance difference, there is a, a, a reasonable uh, cost difference. So for our study, we saw that GAC was more expensive um, in terms of total implementation cost per dollar per acre foot. Um, that includes the, 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 you know, the capital as well as the operating. And as Megan indicated, you know, there is more capital equipment associated with the GAC and more media. Um, so that, that in, the, the, the relationship held that the, the GAC was more expensive, the ion exchange. And our projections of the floor absorb, although not you know, full scale installed um, yet anywhere, it does show that there's really good opportunities for the floor absorb uh, product to, to be much less expensive than either of those two. And now I will hand it back to Megan for some wrap up. And I know we ran a little long here, I apologize. All right, just turning everything back on there. Thanks, Scott. So just quickly, um, I think I have some animation here, so go ahead and just advance a couple of bullets. Um, so we saw all these adsorbents worked well to remove PFAS. 
Um, but you know, doing the testing really helped highlight within each of these groups what were the um, adsorbents that seemed to be show a longer media life for our target uh, driver, which is PFOA for our water. So very useful to identify um, uh, good performing uh, media. And as Scott went over, the bench scale testing for GAC really did show that strong dependency of GAC life on DOC concentration and its character. Um, so for GAC, we're relying on really the RSSET to project GAC life for the water retailers interested in using GAC. Next slide. Oh, one more here. And then as Scott mentioned, um, a really, I think, exciting finding was this, essentially the validation of the RSSET as being uh, predictive of pilot scale and thus full scale performance at the later um, degree of exhaustion that's more relevant anyways to change out media change out times. Next slide. Um, so for the ion exchange that we looked at at pilot scale, um, as I highlighted earlier, all four of the ion exchange products showed later breakthrough relative to all eight GACs for the sulfonates like PFOS and also the short chain PFAS, in our case, PFBS. Um, and we saw encouraging results for that SETCO fluorosorb 200 product in the pilot and confirmed by the lab scale testing as well, suggesting it could be very promising as a cost-effective and, and low footprint treatment technology with the same footprint as ion exchange. So we're doing more work now, uh, working with Jacobs to do more of an engineering evaluation of essentially looking at compatibility of this product if it were to be implemented, filled into um, those full scale um, treatment vessels that are otherwise designed for GAC or ion exchange. Um, it's important to note that while all the media remove PFAS from water, the performance differences in terms of the life of the media did vary dramatically depending on the product. And even just a few months um, later breakthrough or longer life at pilot scale can translate into some pretty significant um, O&M cost savings. So really the uh, price per pound of the media matters, but so does the media life. So that together they can be taken into account to develop um, a best value analysis. Next slide. Um, and Scott already went over this, um, so I'll just keep moving. Next, uh, next steps for our project is that um, construction is underway. So 11 PFAS treatment systems are currently under construction for five different water retailers. So I show a couple of photographs there of the construction sites. And then next in line, the design is ongoing for um, six additional water retailers. So lots of activity, uh, lots of work being done. And we decided to continue with the pilot work. We're still running the pilot now that we showed the data today, just to, for example, see maybe when will P PFOS break through, questions like that. Um, but it's certainly been sufficient data at this point for our overall um, media choices and design for the projects. So we're continuing with the current pilot, but also have uh, commissioned a second phase to look at more types of adsorbents. Next slide. And this is the, the final slide, just to tell you a little bit about our, our phase two pilot that's underway now. So this work we presented today, now we're referring to as the phase one pilot. So we installed and commissioned a new ion exchange skid um, provided by Avoqua, as was the other skids to test some new products. We just started in May, commissioned, um, loaded and, and started flow on those products at the same location as our phase one pilot. So we've thus far loaded four ion exchange resins that we didn't test previously and two uh, different alternative adsorbents. And we're still reviewing other candidates um, and talking to different suppliers. Um, and we plan to load um, several more adsorbents into an additional ion exchange skid. Um, and really it's, we're looking at it like a program where we can consider testing um, new products that become available. So if you are aware of a media that you've, uh, you've heard of or, or seen some data on, please, please let me know and we can consider it for our program. So this, you know, piloting takes quite a while. So I expect we'll still be working on this through the end of, of next year. Um, so I think that's our last slide. And I know we went a bit over time, but if there's, um, if folks want to stick around, Scott and, I, Scott and I are able to stick around and answer um, a few questions. Thanks so much, Megan and Scott, for your presentation today. Um, I appreciate that we are at the top of the hour, but if folks are willing to stay on, or both our speakers today have kindly um, confirm that they're able to stay on for a few minutes to answer questions. Um, I do want to thank our speakers for um, answering some of the some of the questions directly in the Q and A box. So thank you for getting a jump start on that. But um, uh, for folks that do have questions, please go ahead and continue using the Q and A box, um, and we'll go ahead and uh, get started with some of the, the ones that were asked earlier in the presentation. Um, first one: Is there evidence that wastewater from domestic use is the source of substantial PFAS, or is that still a, a guess? 
So I would say nationally, it really just depends so much on the location and whether there's a specific point source versus just the more diffuse use of consumer products that enters the wastewater system. In our case for Orange County, um, potential sources are still under investigation, so. Yeah, and I guess I could add to that, that um, I, I guess it depends on how you define substantial, but we, we definitely have data sets that um, have, you know, clearly defined uh, no industrial sources, you know, into wastewater treatment plants. And um, we, we see tens to hundreds of nanograms per liter of, of PFAS. Um, so we, we do recognize that that you know, consumer use and, and domestic use of of the sewer system is is still a, a reasonable contributor, even though with, when there's no industrial sources present. Thank you. Um, can you make a, a conclusive or outline statement about what happened when you added VOCs and how they interfered interfered with treatments? Um, well, I mean, I think the short answer to that is there is competitive absorption between the VOC and the P PFOA uh, when it comes to adsorption sites on the GAC where they're, they're essentially looking to occupy the same space. Um, so we do see competitive adsorption. Um, it was pretty significant in this case. We're reviewing some other data where the concentrations of the PFAS are higher um, and, and the concentration of the VOCs are about the same and we're not necessarily seeing as competitive of, of, of an effect. So it may not only have to do with the compounds, but it may have to do with the relative concentrations. Thank you, Scott. My next question, is there anywhere where we could find the data for nanofiltration? Yes, so um, Jacobs has completed their overall study report and that's actually available on the OCWD website. If you search on our page for the PFAS info site, it's um, there under resources, I believe. And so the um, treatment study report includes the nanofiltration bench scale work. Right, Scott? I'm trying to remember where that ended up, but it's in that yes. report. Okay. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, for the three types of media considered, were other technologies explored? Um, I've read heat breaks C and F bond. Was it not beneficial to look at other technologies, only these medias? Do you want to take that, Scott? Sure. So, I mean, it would generally be beneficial. There's a lot of work being done right now in terms of destructive technologies, um, electrical oxidation, plasma, you know, heat, heat generated technologies like, like uh, supercritical water oxidation. Um, but generally speaking, the reason that none of them were evaluated under this product is one, um, neither a, a, or any of those products or, or technologies uh, really Really full scale available. Um, and, and quite frankly, even if they become full scale available, um, the, the question of scale up to a drinking water scale um, is, is yet another step in, in that, that, that evaluation matrix. So um, destructive technologies for PFAS, uh, especially a drinking water scale, you know, maybe a decade out. And, and I know Orange County wanted to look at obviously opportunities to uh, install treatment and solve the problem today. So uh, I think that there, that, you know, those, there's a lot of interest in research going on with those technologies right now, but, but it's certainly nothing that uh, utilities are applying for drinking water scale. And if I can just add to that, I feel like where research would be really valuable is just destroying it once it's on the adsorbent. And so thinking of it like a two-step process because adsorption is a very cost-effective way to quickly remove PFAS from the water and it works, um, but it's not destructive. However, if you could take that spent media that has the PFAS on it and then put it through a destruction process, then you know the whole system is actually becomes a destructive system. So I, I wonder if that may be the way that destructive based technologies can be a part of the drinking water landscape where we have such large flows um, to treat that otherwise destructive techniques would probably not be cost effective. It's a good point. I think that is where that needs to head. Thank you. Uh, what differential pressure increases did you see in the pilot columns for the different media over time? I don't remember the exact numbers. I don't know if you do, Megan. 
I think a I, few I, PSI. Yeah, I was going to say, I know they were small enough over the period of time that we never ran into any issues. Um, uh, I know Charlie Lou had asked a question that I answered earlier in the text that we did have pre-filtration on, on them. But if you wanted to get the specifics uh, to Megan's point about going on the website, you can you can look at the report um, that's available online on their website that that does have the, the actual pressure drop data and um, you know how it increased over time. Yeah, we didn't have to do backwashing on the pilot for GAC, um, nor yeah. was clogging really a problem for the other media. And generally we want to avoid that in a pilot system to avoid interrupting the data collection. So hence the additional pre-filtration on the pilot. Gotcha. Uh, can you speak a little bit about media regeneration slash disposable? Uh, I'm sorry, slash disposal. I'll, I'll mainly defer to Scott on that, I guess. But if you're curious about what we're planning for our project, if that's the question, um, generally, um, as I said, the ion exchange media, which is largely the direction that our, our sites are going based on the uh, interest in the smaller footprint, um, would these would all be single use residents. So these would have to be disposed of. And disposal means either taking it away to a landfill or having it incinerated if a company is able to be identified that would do that. So that's kind of a, uh, I would, I guess, a work in progress to, and an evolving landscape in the field is to look at the appropriate ways to dispose of spent media and what the, the cost would be. I don't know, Scott, if you want to add to that. Yeah, the only thing in in general I'd add is if you're in tune with you know what's going on from a PFAS and a national regulation standpoint, there's a, there's obviously some um, movement in terms of potentially listing it as a circla or potentially a wreck or a waste, um, as well as there's been some scrutiny from the EPA over incineration. So all those things can potentially affect you know how we're managing. The, the, the spent media. Um, right now, if, if, a, if a utility is implementing GAC, it is possible to, you know, to reactivate the, the GAC and return it to place. Um, all the other media that we looked at um, for commercial purposes, you know, like with ion exchange or single use, um, some of the alternative media are looking at potential offsite regeneration, but that's more a work in progress. And we're sorry if we missed this one, but is the FS200 an IX media? And if so, who is the manufacturer? Um, the results look very promising uh, for this one. And, and we're yeah, asking um, if that's a so, media we're evaluating further. Right. So the FS200 was our shorthand for the Fluorosorb 200 product. That is, that is neither an ion exchange nor a carbon. We categorize that under the alternative adsorbents um, group along with the Cyclopure Dexorb Plus product. So, so Fluorosorb 200, an alternative adsorbent, is manufactured by Setco. Um, and it's been implemented in other types of projects like environmental PFAS um, projects like land application. Um, and I believe our project, maybe Scott can correct me on this, was the first to really pilot it in more of a drinking water wellhead treatment context. Hence, now we want to do the additional work of an engineering evaluation of, uh, to ensure its compatibility with being loaded into full-scale treatment vessels that were otherwise designed for GAC and ion exchange. So that work is ongoing now. Um, but yeah, we agree it looks, looks promising. And then the costs looked attractive as well. Thank you. And we will get to our final at least live question for today. We recognize there are a lot of questions that are unanswered. So we will be following up after the webinar also. Uh, but we, if we could take this one as the last live question, um, does PFOS treatment technologies also remove other emerging contaminants? Go ahead, Scott, if you want to answer that one. Um, yeah, I, I think that that's a broad brush, maybe. It really depends on the technology and the emerging contaminant. Um, there's certainly a lot of emerging contaminants that are absorbable, um, but, but some are not. So it's, uh, it's definitely not a one size fits all for, for every contaminant, but, but there's, when you look at 
um, studies um, outside the U.S. Or, or applications where in Europe they've they've added you know GAC at the back end of treatment plants for for pharmaceuticals and other endocrine disruptors. Uh, you can you can see data there within the U.S. There's been a lot of work been done by Southern Nevada Water Authority and, and others that you know looked at a, a wide suite of compounds. So it's uh, it. There, not, nothing's a one size fits all, but um, there, there is application for, for each of these for a number of different emerging contaminants. Thank you so much. Well, I, I wanna take this time to thank you all again for attending today's webinar, and especially those who stayed past the hour and um, a huge thank you to our speakers, Dr. Megan Plumley and Dr. Scott Rico for your great presentation today and also for staying on to answer questions. Um, as mentioned, there are a handful of questions that um, we weren't able to get to in this allotted time, but we'd like to uh, follow up with the attendees and with our speakers, if that's okay, after the presentation so we could uh, circle back with some additional information. Um, and again, as Megan and Scott had mentioned, uh, the report is finalized and published on the OCWD website. Um, so again, thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed today's webinar. Uh, this webinar was recorded, uh, so we will be posting that to the OCWD website and our YouTube page as well. And with that, thank you very much. Have a great rest of everyone's day.